everyone. Welcome back to Commotion Labs. Um, as you may or may not remember, uh, my name is Suni. I'm the manager of this floor. Um, Commotion Labs is a multi-industry incubator system that the University of Washington owns. Um, in the back, we have 24 different startups that are working on applications for augmented and virtual reality. And then over at Fluke Hall, that's going to be home to our life sciences, engineering, and medical startups. They also are home to our makerspace, which has just become open to the public. And then over at Startup Hall, we have IT and software startups. And that's also home to Bunker Labs and um, the Techstars Accelerator. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you all to the third event in our five-part blockchain basics series. Um, this event is meant to educate the public and introduce you guys to blockchain in a very accessible way. Um, we will be taking a three-week break after this, so our next event is going to be on Tuesday, um, April 17th, and that's going to be regarding effective business models for blockchain via the Estonian e-residencies and digital, digital identification. Um, if you would like to watch the other two presentations that we've, prese or that we've held here, um, you can find those on our YouTube channel. Um, our sponsors of the event have been the Seattle Angel Conference, so thank you, John, for collaborating with us on that. And then also the Seattle Angel Fund and the Seattle Entrepreneurship Club. And I'm thrilled to welcome our four speakers for the event, or I guess one moderator and three speakers for the event today, John Seacrest, Casey Moore, Justin Jacobs, um, and Pat Larson. So thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. So do we have someone from the Seattle Entrepreneurship Program to talk today? No? Okay. So let me give the little, you know, 30-second plug for the Seattle Angel Conference. Our goal with the Angel Conference is to... I'm on a mic. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> ah, so um, our goal with the Angel Conference is to create more angel investors. And so we do that by teaching angel investing by doing angel investing. And we run through a 12-week program. So we're on the middle of the process right now. Tonight, we'll pick the semifinalists. And on May 16th, we'll write a check for one of the finalist companies as they present. So we'll do uh, uh, the event in the UW Tower right over there on May 16th. Um, if you are considering uh, taking outside money for a company, we'd love to talk to you and help you understand what that process looks like. And all of you know that uh, 45 year old to 50 or to 65 year old, 15 percent of them are accredited investors, and most of them don't know they're accredited. So if you find someone in that age group and you uh, wake them up to the possibility, and they say, "Oh, that might be interesting," we would love to help them figure out where they can find a place to stand in angel investing to make this thing go for the rest of the community. We run at several other things for entrepreneurs like Lean Startup Seattle and the Open Coffees. So if you care about those things, catch me afterwards. But we're going to turn our attention to the blockchain question. And what essentially happened is that um, a bunch of people long ago saw this thing they could buy for a really cheap price that they thought was cool. And then they bought some cryptocurrency. And now they have a lot of wealth in cryptocurrency which has consequences. And we wanted to sort of dive into those consequences. How many people here have cryptocurrency that they own? So maybe half the room. Anybody buy it at like less than $10? Yeah, a couple, all right. So now we had, you know, I had $10, and now that's worth 20,000. No, it's worth 10,000. No, it's 15, no, it's seven. And so there's some volatility to the market, and there's uh, 15, 1,700 different kinds of coins. And sometimes you have to buy Ethereum so that you can buy some other sub uh, kind of coin. And there's a whole conversation in what that means. Does anybody here have a Visa card that's backed by blockchain-based currencies? No, so there are like 27 different cards out there that are Visa cards, and I'm going to use that as an example for how that might turn into things. Before we get too far into this then, um, I'd like to uh, in, uh, have our panelists sort of introduce themselves and sort of frame the conversation. So I'm going to play the angel investor role, and Casey is... Thanks, John. So my name is Casey Moore. I'm a tax senior manager at a CPA firm and a consulting firm called Moss Adams, LLP. We're one of the top 100 firms in the nation, have about 32 offices, somewhat Midwest, mostly on the West Coast. Uh, I focus my practice primarily on technology companies, all the way from four or five founder-backed early stage startups to public companies and everything in between. I'd say the bulk of it's probably first or second 
VC backed round tech companies, um, but mainly tax and mainly technology. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Justin Jacobs. I'm an international tax senior, uh, also of Moss Adams. Uh, I'm a JDLM, uh, and I have long kind of found this space to be very interesting, and have you know been uh, getting more and more involved in it. And I'm excited for this conversation. So, hi, I'm Pat Larson. Uh, I used to be a combat medical uh, evacuation helicopter pilot in the Navy. Um, then have been in tech startups for about five or six years. Uh, founded uh, ZenLedger.io. And we're a um, ledger aggregation engine, and our first product is, is to help with taxes, kind of like a turbo tax for cryptocurrency. We successfully had a seed round in January, and we're uh, in the middle of raising another round as we launch our product, which is now uh, in like a soft launch uh, live beta. Cool. So let's start with that notion of in 2009, I bought something for, you know, $10, and now I have a lot of money, and over the last 10 years, you know, Ethereum's cool, I'll get one of those. Oh, Litecoin's cool, I'll get one of those. And now I have this great big wad of that. And I've never told anybody about it, except I just kept trading that. What, what's gonna happen? So there are two concepts really there. Uh, we'll talk about one, unrealized gains versus realized gains. Um, let's just take unrealized gains out of the picture to begin with. Let's just say you buy a coin, 10 years ago, hold on to it, never traded it for another coin, never sold it, or traded it for cash. Same coin, you know, maybe it's worth 1,500% more than it was when you bought it. You're not taxed on that gain. It's what we call an unrealized gain. You've never exchanged it, you've never realized a gain. Conversely, every time a coin is traded for another coin or for cash or used to purchase a product or service, that's what we consider a realization transaction, where in those scenarios, under the rules of, of property transactions, you would have a realized gain or loss, and in theory would be taxed on the value of what you received, less the tax basis of what you gave up in that transaction. That's essentially the high-level explanation of it. So, so I'm, I'm a little confused. I'm going to pl play the confused angel investor here. So. I have cryptocurrency, it's currency. If I take my dollar and I trade it for a euro and then I trade it back, there's no realized gain because it's just currency. So I can think about my Bitcoin thing or my Litecoin or whatever as a asset like you just did, or I can think of it as a utility token which is not either a currency or an asset, or I can think of it as a currency. Mm -hmm. So. Why, when I buy other coins, is it a realized thing when I'm actually just trading back and forth the shape of the thing and not actually realizing any money? Sure, yeah. And, and you know, the function of these coins can very much take on those different shapes to whoever's using them. I mean, someone can use them for one reason, someone can use them as a store of value. The IRS looks at it one way at this point in time, and that it's property. But that's different than they did six months ago. That's not true. So they, no, didn't, they, they, didn't they, they just flip, or was it the SEC that flipped? Some, some government agency changed their mind about whether it was an asset or a currency. Yeah, so I, I think that's SEC. Okay. So the IRS since 2014 has looked at cryptocurrency as property rather than currency. Meaning a whole host of different rules apply to transactions involving cryptocurrency than would apply otherwise to just currencies in general. And the idea behind that was to track the tax impacts of trading property, there's a lot more record keeping involved than there would be for currency. Specifically, you identify the specific coins that would be traded and the coins you received, when you bought them, how much the value was at that time versus how much the value is when you traded. And essentially they apply a framework of pushing a lot of record keeping onto the taxpayer to track something that is very difficult for them to track or what is estimated for them to be very difficult to track back at that time. That's one of the ideas around why this was treated as property. And I think there are To make it easy for the IRS. Make it a little easier for the IRS and push the record keeping back onto the taxpayer. Although there are, there are other reasons I've found that one to be very convincing. Okay, so, so Pat, um, I, I just did my little transaction on my little Visa back card thing 
and I bought a hamburger, what price was it? So there's a dollar price that you can mark to, and that's uh, part of what our software does. It's just constantly marking to market. Um, so there's, there's simple use cases, and then there's complex use cases, right? But there's like three different exchanges, which yep. if you look at them, give you three different prices, yep. and the price during the day is moved by you know, yeah. several percentage so points. So you got to mark, you got to ticket. So you, you can't like just close out at the end of the day or the end of the month. You got to grab it at that spot price when you converted, and that, that tells you the gap either a gain or a loss um, that, that you incurred. So if I just wait five minutes, I might have a lower priced burger. But you have to, the cost of waiting for that burger is also incurred. There's, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so there's other interesting parts of realized versus unrealized gains. Um, so Coinbase is by far the largest uh, fiat on-ramp where people turn their uh, US dollars into cryptocurrency. And uh, if you stay inside Coinbase, you're, you're probably fine. They, they just re released a really nice tax tool if you stay inside Coinbase. But uh, on their blog announcement, they explicitly state in like six bullet points at the end that this will not work for you if you did ICOs, if you went off their exchange, um, which basically means 99% of people who have gains are actually active in cryptocurrency. Uh, that tool in of itself doesn't work, and that's why you have to ha use uh, an aggregation service and a CPA that understands uh, uh, going across exchanges. So if you just move your Ethereum or your Bitcoin from Coinbase to Bittrex, Coinbase would report that as a sale, and you just incurred a tax liability, a, a gain, a realized gain, or, or loss. Uh, whereas in, in actuality, it was a non-taxable transfer from Coinbase to Bittrex. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't cash out your, your uh, Bitcoin. You didn't sell it into dollars or sell it to Ethereum. So, so you need software that catches that. Otherwise, uh, you're, you're misreporting your taxes, and it be, could be costing you a lot. Like tens of thousands of dollars. Say it again. It's, it's messy in that um, it, you're not treating it like you just sent a house in between two exchanges. Um, in, in a lot of ways, a cryptocurrency does behave uh, like a stock is, is a much easier way to think about it. Like, oh, I sold Bitcoin for Ethereum. I sold, uh, uh, whatever, Tesla for Amazon. That's, that's often uh, a more intuitive way to think about if that transaction has been taxable. So, so like, um, the, there's a legal fiction that people have tried that say, like, oh, I can use a 1031 exchange. Oh, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, that was like in kind. Everyone kind of knows that's really not the case, and that's not, the auditor isn't really going to uh, take that story either uh, if you're in front of one. So I would, I would, you know, you make your own decisions with your CPA when you file your taxes, but our software does not account for 1031 exchanges, uh, and we treat... Um, Bitcoin to Ethereum to Litecoin to Monero as, as all different taxable transactions where you're, you're changing, materially changing the asset class. And, and I think we need to take a step back here. I mean, the problem with the tax issues is that the IRS has given such limited guidance. I mean, you, we're all kind of sitting here going, we want more, um, but we haven't gotten a lot of it. Um, there's basically one notice in 2014, uh, and then they gave us a press release last week saying, make sure you're paying your taxes. Um, and that's kind of what the deal is. Um, On crypto. Sure it, right, crypto it, right, exactly. Um, and, you know, and, and that, you know, that creates complications because, I mean, you know, the reality is that these tokens and, and cryptocurrencies and so on, they, they have so many attributes as to what they can do. Um, and it creates really kind of unique um, understandings on the tax implications. So, um, but I thought that was important to kind of rewind and kind of just, you know, let everybody know. There's not a lot of guidance on there. It's not really the kind of a clear cut, like, yes or no. Well, let's dive into that messiness a little bit deeper. Um, I can buy, a, I can get a debit card where the debit card is a fiat-based debit card, but backed by blockchain. So it keeps all of the stuff in Bitcoin, except, uh, uh, I, or I load it with Bitcoin, but it keeps it in dollars on the thing so I can use it. But when I want to move it around on the back end, it moves it with uh, Bitcoin. Or I can have a uh, debit card that keeps it in Bitcoin and then makes the transaction to fiat as I make the purchase. So there's like two different cards that I can select out of the list of 27 cards that are available. Are they the same? So the first one you described sounded like, Lynn, t tell me if I got this right. You have a certain amount of coin in an account. In an account. Mm -hmm. You want to load cash to a debit card, essentially, by mm -hmm. saying, I'm going to designate one coin that I can now spend in, in USD. Right. 
Uh, if the way that transaction works is at the time that you load the card with the USD, then that's the taxable transaction, and that card, the balance on that card represents cash that came from a realized transaction of trading whatever coin, however, whatever volume to realize that. So the act of loading that card then produces a tax event. Yeah, so if it works the way I described where, you know, at that time, coin is traded, a certain amount of cash is received, and that's the cash that that card draws from, then yes, that, that's the taxable transaction, the initial conversion of that coin into cash for them. It's, it's the same really as selling a coin on an exchange, taking the cash out, putting it in your bank account, and using it on your debit card. Okay. The second scenario sounds like, and tell me if I got this wrong, every transaction is pulling from a pool of coins that you have access to in your account right. or wallet. So every time you enter a transaction, whether it's swiping it for a burger, um, whatever, Starbucks, there's an there's a com instant conversion from coin to cash to then transact that. Yeah. So that, that's the same really as sitting on a, an exchange trading, you know, every minute, every hour, whatever. It's, it's like, it's just still a bunch of mini transactions that would all have to be accounted for separately because you may have different basis in those coins from years ago, currently, depends on when you purchase them, if you traded for other coins, I mean, it just sounds like a mess. It's so, tough. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's why you need to aggregate things. So say you bought uh, one Bitcoin two years ago and one Bitcoin um, one month ago, right? And so you're going to have like two different cost bases. Uh, and as you draw down, depending on the environment and how you want to account, LIFO, FIFO, rising price environment, declining price environment, uh, you can kind of min-max your taxes that way. Uh, so, so say you draw down uh, $10,000 uh, of cash, and that, that burns through one Bitcoin and burns through 0.1 of the second Bitcoin that you've owned over the last two years. Now you have a decision on, oh, do, you know, how do I want to treat that? Do I want to burn through the old Bitcoin first? And is that a better tax situation for me? Or do I want to burn through the, new, the, the, the newer one, the, the last end first out? And that's something that software can do and your CPA can do. But keeping it all uh, in track, like seeing how it, it goes and having the analysis done for you is, is exactly what we do. It seems a little bit strange that when I take my Visa card out and I buy a burger, that the tax consequences are dramatically different burger to burger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so it's like, uh, do I have airline miles or not, right? So you, mm -hmm. before you use that card, you make a decision on how your transactions are going to look and how you're going to move through this world economically, right? So do you have Bitcoin? I do. And do you have whole Bitcoins that you keep together, or do you have them I split up? I count them every night. Little and I polish them. <laughs> yeah. Little, yeah. little tiny pieces of Bitcoin spread over. They are strewn about. Different, I actually, yes. um, just just because of uh, what I had to do, since I have developers that need a lot of uh, data, is I had to go into Coinbase and Gemini and buy a bunch of, of different currencies and move them all around and chop them up into altcoins and move them back and put them on wallets. So my taxes are really bad. Um, uh, so, so like, as, as and, and I, I don't look exactly like a crypto whale. A lot of our initial customers uh, have had, uh, and investors have had, like, years of transactions, and they've jumped in and out of ICOs, and they've been in and out of privacy coins. They've been, uh, they've been goxed, and they've lost stuff, and, and they've gifted things. And, and so, like, it can get quite complex when you start uh, having a lot of asset and you say, this has, this has power, this has value, I can do things with it. I can donate it to charity, I can uh, buy office space, I can pay people around the world with it. Um, so, so as you decide on a card, you should know beforehand what that card is and what it does and then behave accordingly. Maybe one of those cards you use um, for certain transactions and others you don't. So if you don't want to incur a big, a bunch of headaches, <coughs> but you love like transacting in Bitcoin, then you do the one where you, you load a Bitcoin, it incurs a tax obligation right there, and now you're just spending dollars. And that's cool, right? But if, you, if, uh, if that's the much simpler case, right? Right. So uh, I do ICOs. Uh, since ICOs are weird, um, I do them out of the country because then I've got a different set of rules somewhere, or I, so I think, even though the U.S. actually does SEC law worldwide regardless, unless... How many people here are not U.S. citizens? You guys are lucky. You are not taxed worldwide. Everybody else is taxed worldwide in the room, which means your SEC transactions are also tracked worldwide. So I'd just done an, uh, an ICO for a company in Aberbujan, and I 
bought it with my credit card that was Bitcoin thing. What's the consequence of that from a from a uh, investor point of view? What am I going to end up getting myself doing? No, this is a legal question. I'm thinking. Well, uh, I mean, in terms of you know, you're purchasing an asset, um, so right. you know you clearly have an asset now um, that you're holding until it's realized gains. Um, but you, you know, similar to the other one, as we just kind of said with the 1031 exchanges and that they're not likely to be uh, respected, um, you know, basically if you had gain on that Bitcoin, then that's a taxable event. Um, you exchange property for property. Um, so as soon as I bought into the ICO with my Bitcoin, then I have a taxable event. And then whatever the random value of that random ICO that probably is worth zero, is now a loss, and I have to somehow turn that altcoin that is a piece of uh, fiction into a loss. How do I do that? I don't think that that's quite, I mean. So 90%, this is my personal opinion, 90% yes. of ICOs are fiction, sure. and I'm buying a piece of somebody's story which has a net value of zero. Right. So I've bought it, and now I've decided it's worth zero, and I would like to declare that on my taxes, how do I do that? Well, I mean, you, you don't get to kind of just declare it as zero. I mean, the amount you paid in is actually the amount that it's worth. Um, I mean, you bought it. But it's not because it wasn't worth anything to begin with. Well, <laughs> So I traded many dollars for zero dollars, and now I would like to sort of close my books on that so I don't have to keep tracking it. How do I do that? Well, so again, you're holding an ICO that has unrealized gains or losses yep. now. So you know, you're not closing the books until you have a realization event on that. So it's actually just sitting out there um, for the Forever. time being. Forever. Until you, you sell it or, or until you, you know, eventually can you know, claim it as, as, as a loss on right. um, So I'm going to go jump into the angel investing place, right? So in angel investing, we have a bunch of companies that apply to us, something like thousands of them, and we filter out 900 of them. And then we have 100 that we look at. And of the 100 that we look at, we might actually hear 10. And of the 10 that we hear, we might invest in one. That's a normal kind of thing. And of the 10 that we've invested in, 60% of them are worth $0. They go to zero. <clears throat> Another 30% of them return some positive number, but not a big one. And then 10% of them invest uh, uh, some bigger than five times 5x return. So that's the normal venture capital model, both for angels and VCs, uh, about like that. So the answer to be successful at angel investing is to diversify your portfolio, to be in at least 20 deals. Some people say 40. There's even one guy that says 500. So you know, a lot of different deals. In some way, being in uh, Bitcoins or something like that, diversification matters there as well, right? But one of the things that doesn't show up in those statistics is the zombies, the companies that are not dead, which are never going to be dead until the owner dies, um, but which never turn into an exit, so the investors never get out of it. And so we have these companies, uh, some people uh, refer to them pleasantly as lifestyle businesses, but they could be more than a lifestyle business. They're just an effective business with reasonable margin that allows them to stay alive for a long time, but are uninteresting from a growth perspective, so you can't sell them. So now you have a perfectly good zombie running along, and you're an angel investor, and I have this stock, and it's year 15, and the owner of the company who is the CEO is in love with his product and it's working just fine, he's getting a good salary, but no margin beyond that. What do I do with that? Well, an easy way maybe to realize that loss would be to sell the stock back to the company. In right, a so I could, for... I could sell it to the company, yes, mm -hmm. that's good. So if I can negotiate that with the company, then that's a win, right? right. And so there's, there's also at Alliance of Angels, they have a zombie fund. And so they will buy any of your zombie stock for a dollar. <laughs> so if any of you are angel investors and you have zombies, Alliance of Angels will buy that. So maybe one of the business opportunities somewhere in the middle of this um, ICO noise is a ICO zombie fund where you will buy any ICO token for a dollar. Yes? Um, because every now and then it's not. 
And so if I buy, you know, $100,000 of stock and then it goes to zero and I buy uh, that for a dollar and every now and then, every thousand companies, something magical happens and it's worth something, then I'm way, way, way ahead, right? And so uh, the reason they do it is to keep the angel investors from being uh, complaining about their piles of zombie stock, <laughs> which uh, is an important thing for an angel group to do is to keep their investors happy in the process. But there seems to be an opportunity there. Uh, yeah, I would just say it's a, it's a lottery ticket, yeah. right? And lots of people really enjoy buying lottery tickets for a bunch of different reasons. There's some, you know, there's some upside, but mostly it's it's for the fun of it. So how many people here buy lottery tickets? <laughs> oh, only a couple. But All right. Millions do. Millions and millions of people do. Yeah. Okay. So um, we see that how I think about currency really needs to be subtle, because where I'm tracking the little bits are important. That's why I might need a piece of software to do that, right? Are there other pieces of software besides Zenledger that do this level of, you know, minute by minute uh, um, figuring out what my credit card is doing? So I would say that Zenledger is unique in that we're bringing uh, a lot more of um, technical expertise to it. So our CTO, Brian Starbuck, uh, was 10 years at Microsoft. He was on the Internet Explorer team that, that won against Netscape. And then the last 10 years, he's been running uh, his own startups as a CEO, CTO, founder. Uh, currently, he's leading a team of 10 developers to, to charge at, at this problem. Um, and so I think we're just, we have, like, you know, we're out developing a lot of our competition. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 2017 is the first year that a lot of people made a lot of gains in crypto. Uh, before that, it really didn't make sense for a professional team to look at capital gains, capital loss uh, globally and solve that problem for people. So, so Bitcoin.tax and uh, Cointracking.info have been around for a couple of years, but they're both one or two person firms and they're very manual, they're lacking in automation, they haven't really been vetted uh, thoroughly by uh, you know, lawyers and accountants. There, there's a lot of math that's, that's off in them. So I would be like really careful uh, in using some of the, the software that's around there. They're well known, people have used them a lot, but I think um, there, there's a lot left to be desired from, from like a, a global uh, look at all these cryptocurrency transactions. I don't think they're doing the hard math and pulling as, many, uh, as much market data as us. So say you're on uh, Binance and you sell uh, Ray blocks uh, for, for Dogecoin, right? And, and that was just coin to coin, and it was in a foreign uh, exchange, and, and uh, so there's no dollar impact there, right? But you have to mark right at that second to market those, that coin transaction. That caused a, a dollar value right there. Mm -hmm. And then if you exceed $10,000 on any of these exchanges, you start incurring uh, foreign reporting uh, standards. So you need to know. What's a foreign reporting standard? Uh, so, so we, we create those, uh, and you know, like uh, 8949 and, and FinCEN compliance. Let's but have I would, our I would love to, tell yeah, us for the a lawyer. Details, yeah. So there is informational reporting that's required by the IRS um, for uh, foreign bank accounts. Um, uh, it's called FBAR filing as well as 8938 um, uh, reporting on specified assets. Um, and basically, if you have over a certain threshold of, um, for certain types of accounts, uh, then you have reporting that's informational reporting to the IRS. Uh, this is not an impact necessarily on your taxable return. Um, but it, what it is, is it's information that this is kind of out there. Um, it's a big deal if you don't do it because the statute of limitations on your return can be indefinite uh, and it's up to $10,000 per form. So um, it's a really big deal. Uh, and so per you know, form each year. Yeah. Um, and so we, uh, you know, we absolutely are in the boat where we are kind of recommending people. You, you know, there is not a lot of guidance out there, as I said, but you want to show that you're trying your best. Um, and so we've been, you know, absolutely encouraging people to try to do their FBARs and, and, uh, and FATCA filings. Um, yeah. It's a big deal. FATCA. Yeah. So that's, yeah. That's, that's like the government making sure you're not laundering money and supporting terrorists. So, so they look right. at that uh, pretty seriously. Yeah. So the, yes. So or there's not, this. Or not paying your taxes. Or not paying your taxes. <laughs> yeah. Interesting company, country called Estonia. Estonia has a 100% digital government. Their laws are digital. Your payment to the government taxes is digital. Your voting is digital, et cetera. Have a digital ID. Um, they have a company in Estonia called Funderbean.eu that does tokenizing of stocks of companies. And so you can buy into that exchange and you get a token. And then that token is exchangeable with other people on that platform. So 
I have Bitcoin, I have a to or not Bitcoin, I have blockchain, I have a token that represents that stock, of, that piece of stock of that company. If I invest in an Estonian company through Funderbeam, which now has this blockchain based token, and that company succeeds, what happens in terms of my taxes? I have tens of thousands of dollars that I've invested in them. They then um, spike in value. It's sitting in this little token in their little exchange thing. Then what? Sure. Well, I think in that scenario, we would apply the same framework that we've discussed earlier, ver realized versus unrealized gains and losses. Um, I mean, that sounds a lot like a derivative to me, but if it's tokenized and it's considered cryptocurrency under the IRS property rules, then I think we would look at it at the same framework. You know, your gain is, is what, when you have a realized transaction, what you sell it for versus what your basis is, you know, at the time that you, however it was that you acquired it. Uh, the international risks start to come in in that, you know, that gain definitely needs to be reported in the U.S. It's under a worldwide tax system. Um, and then is that asset or derivative or currency or what, you know, whatever it ends up being, does that need to be reported under the FACTA rules? And, that, you know, that's where the risk would start to come in. Okay. And so if I open a bank account in Estonia to do it, then I would immediately um, get myself into the foreign tax reporting thing because I'm moving into euros and deploying it through this bank account and moving more than $10,000. And so investing directly in that token would be a different thing, but they don't take dollars. They only take euros. So I'd have to touch euros somewhere in there. Um, they're afraid of FATCA. So they don't accept US guys. And so this is a fictional example because they're not willing to play the reporting game on the other side. And so there's actually 90% of the rest of the world where someone who is in this room might not actually be able to get into the deal because the people on the other side of the deal won't play because they don't want to report FATCA. So part of this whole stuff is fiction because can't play at all because the IRS has rules about reporting. Okay, so anybody doing foreign investments? No, we're jumping down a rabbit hole that nobody cares about. All right, so let, let's, let's go back towards the, the coins. Um, so if I am buying coins, when should I um, start the process of um, tracking the details of which one is which? I mean, you want to right away. Like every time I do a transaction, I got to write it down in my little notebook? Well, not necessarily. I think implementing a software like what we're describing is, is the way to go from the start. I mean, I think what most people are going to run into is, is the sheer amount of data and digging back through history of transactions. So writing it down in my notebook is a non-starter is what you just said. <laughs> well, it could, it could work. I mean, <laughs> I think it depends on the volume of transactions and what your goals are. But honestly, I think... Implementing a, a software system seems to make a lot of sense for especially someone who will be using a debit card uh, in the second example that you described yeah. most certainly and, and doing high volume trading. Yeah. I think, um, so in our product roadmap, we also want to have an app. You know, so if we have your APIs connected across multiple exchanges, uh, we're watching you know, your, your, uh, your exchanges in real time. Uh, that, that's basically portfolio management at the same time. Um, and what we can do is, hey, we saw a transaction. Here's an alert. Was that you? Yes or no? If it was you, would you like to characterize it right now? Was that just a trade? Was that a transfer? Uh, were you paying a contractor in Bitcoin? And then, like, you're keeping your books uh, current, uh, you know, live. In uh, real time, yeah. And then as we add, like, machine learning, we can start tagging these things. Like, we'll have all your public address keys. We don't ingest your private ones. But if we just see, a, you know, three, ex you know, uh, each quarter, Bitcoin to Bitcoin to this public address, and you've you've already labeled it. Oh, that's my that's my web developer in Estonia. Then we'll just like tag the rest, and it starts to make things very easy and clean. You know, Mint.com and American Express have done this hard work on their side, and that's why like you know when you have a business credit card, you always use it for your business expenses, and then everything's clean, and you you know send off to your CPA. And we're we're seeking to try to make things easier on that side, on the crypto side for for people. Okay, so probably I'm going to use a piece of software. You're currently the only software that does it at this level, so that's good. What happens if I'm trying to avoid my um, tax consequences of all of this craziness, and instead of giving you cash out of my regular bank account, I give you cash out of my IRA? What are the tax consequences to that? 
So in, in that example, cash out of your IRA to Bitcoin, pay. and then I go do all of that crazy swap between all the different pieces of the things. Okay, so I'm just trading under your IRA, right? But okay, yeah. I so because I don't like having software track anything, I'm just going to pretend that things that are in my IRA are untaxable. Well, it should still be tracked. Although it, all the realized gains and losses may not be taxed, the basis and everything in there needs to be tracked, just like it is for stocks and other investments. So, so just even if I'm doing it in a tax exempt account. I have to be tracking all the details of all the transactions because it'll change the basis. Correct, and eventually that money comes out and there are different types of tax-free accounts where you may be taxed on the distributions, you may take early distributions. I mean, you'll need to know this information or else, you know, in scenarios where there's a lack of information, the IRS will often just assume the worst. Yeah, the IRS puts the burden on you to track your assets and your transactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always up to you in the end. You're the one signing your tax return and your, and your CPA are. Yeah. Okay, so where are we at in terms of questions? Yeah, so good. This is a good point for you guys if you've got questions. How many people in the room have questions about what happened? Well, actually, before I do this, w one last thought from an angel investor point of view. So how many people think that they should take all of their wealth and put it into angel investing? Nobody? Okay, so I know somebody who's done 90% of his wealth, and I know somebody who's done 50% of those wealth. The 90% guy is very happy. The 50% guy is very unhappy. Um, and so I typically recommend that people do only 10% of their net worth into high-risk kinds of things, right? And so if I have 80 90% of my net worth in Bitcoin, should I be thinking about some kind of diversification pathway um, where I might spread that out a little bit? I would say so. Uh, so putting so on I my, went from $10 yeah. to $20,000 per coin. Now I'm a multimillionaire in Bitcoin yeah. name only. And because I believe in Bitcoin, I'm going to hold. <laughs> so putting on my uh, uh, Booth MBA iBanking hat, uh, diversification has been proven to be pretty good. You can go the Warren Buffett model where you have a couple eggs and you watch them really closely. Um, in that case, either way, you know, just holding on to lots of Bitcoin, just piling in Bitcoin long term, just that's that's on you as an investor to decide if you're in early days, mid days, late days, uh, and what what amount of volatility you want to incur. So if you're just piling into Bitcoin and you just do that on a dollar cost average over years, then hopefully in five years that looks great. Um, but it could just be that Bitcoin goes to zero because uh, Ethereum or EOS or Litecoin took the entire market. It, can, it could change overnight, right? And then that lack of diversification is really going to bite you. Um, and then if, you know, I, a lot of our C investors, we raised in January, that was all-time highs for the stock market and Ethereum and Bitcoin. And they diversified out of it because they realized uh, part of it was they were extremely lucky, right? They'd been in uh, Ethereum for two years. They never got goxed or anything. They put in ICOs. They've built this huge nest egg just from being incredibly curious and a bit adventurous. And now they, they want to start their own angel fund. They want to start their own startups. And you pay, you pay for office space in dollars. You, you, know, you pay for a laptop in dollars, and, and you invest. Uh, I actually, we opened a corporate Gemini account, so we, we took investment in Bitcoin and Ethereum, but we immediately liquidated to dollar uh, because we we're funding a startup. We're not uh, running a crypto hedge fund. Um, so, so in terms of diversification, when I talk to my C investors and potential investors, it's that, look, you, you've had a great run here. Maybe we're at a local high. Maybe we're at an all-time high. But what you want to think about is um, if, if your thesis is long-term blockchain and cryptocurrency, then invest in the infrastructure of it as well. Um, get exposure to people building real tools. Uh, one of my co-founders, Drew Nordstrom, you, you know, he's uh, work, finishing up his JD MBA, but he's, he's from the Nordstrom family. His dad founded Nordstrom.com in the 90s. Like, they, their, their family is built on selling picks and shovels, uh, you know, literally. Literally, And we're, yes. we're doing that digitally, yeah. Right. So if you are in Bitcoin and you're winning at the moment, then consider diversifying, I think it's probably worth your while to spread things out. One of the places is to invest in entities that are doing things with Bitcoin and still stay in the Bitcoin space. But even that might be uh, a little bit too narrow and think about even wider in terms of what you're doing. So in terms of questions, how many people have questions that they want to ask this lovely panel? We've answered all. OK, so if you have a question, line up here. And Pat, if you would put your thing up there, then. We'll get that on the mic, and then 
you can ask questions. Maybe this isn't working. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, we haven't really uh, touched on sort of why uh, this currency exists and how it exists. Uh, for instance, I'm a little bit more interested in kind of the blockchain technology and how it uh, allows Bitcoin to not be uh, essentially something that you could copy. Why can't I just make this on my computer and then have millions of dollars in fake currency? So we talked about that at our first Oh, talk, sorry, I and missed so that. So we're doing okay. a whole series so, and they've dived deep. Uh, um, there are I apologize. Plen plenty I did, I missed of, that one. Um, uh, there are 75 Bitcoin-oriented meetup groups in, in the C greater Seattle area, so it's not okay. like there's a shortage of so, that particular conversation. So I'll ask um, another quick question. Then. That would be great. Uh, is uh, does it make sense at this point to think about uh, if I'm interested in, in investing in bit Bitcoin, does it make sense uh, to, as you said, diversify, invest in seven different coins, or um, should I maybe just stay in one? As a, as so, just a so let's ask that a slightly different way. Sure. There are 1,700 <laughs> coins. Um, which are the 1,700 coins should he be investing his hard-earned money in so that he has a good chance? All 17, should, should he round robin through all 1,700? Should he pick a couple? What's the state of the market? Uh, so I'm not a, yeah, I'm not a accredited uh, or certified uh, a legal or tax professional, so I'll just talk. Um, About what you do. Yeah. Um, so, so there's a couple different theses again. So one of them is, uh, hey, I think Bitcoin's the long-term behemoth. That's the 800-pound gorilla. There'll, like all value will end up shifting back to Bitcoin because of network effects and it's tie, uh, tried and tested true. Like there's tons of attacks all the time. It's incredibly distributed. Uh, the encryption's fine. All that, right? So, so I'll just load into Bitcoin, and that's that's fine if you're if if you're okay with the massive risk you're taking, right? If you want to invest in cryptocurrencies and take a bit less risk, then you start having to do more research, and you have to start asking yourself, am I investing in this cryptocurrency in, in like Ethereum because I think it's going to be used, or am I investing in um, EOS because I think that's more like a stock. I think the value of that uh, company, not necessarily, you know, is, is going to go up. So these are, these are vastly different investment theses, just like you're buying a brick of gold, uh, some Tesla, and then you're opening up a, a Quiznos across the street, right? There, there, there are ways to deploy your asset, you know, U.S. dollars or whatever, and they're, they're vastly different risk profiles. Um, and, and they all have uh, an uncertain future that, that we're all just here trying to figure out, right? Good job. Hi. Um, so you guys kind of touched on this a bit, but I wanted more questions. So say I have, like, various altcoins, Bitcoins, Ethereum, in a cold wallet, but I haven't changed any of it into fiat. What is, like, the tax implications on that if I don't intend to sort of, like, turn any of it into dollars or euros or whatever this year? So, so, do you have multiple coins, different kinds? Ten. ten different kinds of coins. Yeah. Have you been exchanging the coins? Exchanging the coins with him, okay. like Ethereum stuff, which is Ripple, and Celsius. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it just goes back to the first, the first dis question that we had: uh, realize versus unrealized gains. If you're trading coin for coin, whether it's in a back alley or you know wallet to wallet or on an exchange. In a Starbucks. In a Starbucks. <laughs> All right. It'll be in a Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that, that's a realized transaction. That, that's a gain or, or a loss, even. Um, Which means that you have to, write, have to pay taxes on it this year. Correct, yeah. So the year in which the transaction takes place is the year that it's reported for taxes. Um, there's, there's not really a distinction between exchange, hot wallet, cold wallet yeah. in terms of what you're doing. You're just uh, you're changing one asset to another. And once you materially change the asset you're holding, you incur a uh, tax obligation. Um, and uh, the IRS is currently hiring a bunch of chain analysis companies. Uh, chain analysis and Blockseer 
uh, they have a bunch of you know three letter organization contracts to to just scrub blockchains left and right globally and you know like most of us aren't going to pop up on that list of like oh uh, that's a 10 million dollar opportunity for an auditor to go after um, but but it's 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 being watched right so at some point you know if, if you stay in your cold wallet um, forever then that's fine but then there's there's like no value if you stay in the cold wallet forever yes it is The difference is, I mean, in the purchase, you know, one one you're describing is a purchase, right? I mean, the dollar for the Ethereum is a purchase, um, and then that creates this kind of you know unrealized gain loss that's out there. Uh, the other one is an exchange, uh, which is the taxable transaction. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions that people have? Please. In the microphone. Um, Thank so you. I'm supposed to come here and learn because I want to uh, invest with my daughter, and I miss most of it. But my question is, uh, of all these um, brokers, uh, can someone, if you don't mind, just point out one or two that would save me a whole bunch of trouble to go Brokers, research. what do you mean by broker? Um, like, uh, if I want to work with a broker, is there any particular one you guys would recommend? So um, I, I am unaware of people who are brokers for blockchain who I would like to do business with. <laughs> um, and the place that I would do business is on one of the exchanges, like uh, Coinbase being sort of the classic answer, or Bittrex being the other one. There's another one, Binance, I think it is. Yeah. Um, th those all seem to be relatively stable and seem to be doing things, and you can do those online. And if you're doing this with your daughter, you should sit down with your daughter and do it in person with her and understand what you're doing together. Um, there are, again, 75 uh, different uh, meetups that talk about this, and they actually walk through it in some of them, and you can actually buy your first Bitcoin online right there. Anyone who's offering uh, financial expertise and services and advice in blockchain is probably a scamster, and you should not deal with them at all. Um, there's, there's no one who's a reputable broker who will take your dollars and get you a great price on Bitcoin. There, there's none of that. The, so the, stay away from those people. No federal certification of anyone doing anything with any blockchain stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. yeah. Yeah, she and I have fun doing a lot of stock, but for us it's more like have, having fun. So, um, but I, I would love to learn. So, so uh, if you go to A16Z, uh, if you Google A16Z mm -hmm. cryptocurrency uh, articles or knowledge base, mm -hmm. there will just be a list of articles there uh, yeah. put together by Andreessen Horowitz, yeah. and those are great. Okay. Uh, and you can just start there and start working your way through. Mm -hmm. um, and quickly, you know, like you'll just be in the top 1% of knowledgeable people because most people <laughs> read nothing. Uh, so, so you'll be much better off. Yeah. A16Z, Alpha 16 Zulu. Andreessen. Horowitz, <laughs> A to Z, with 16 other things in the middle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions that you want to go with? So, yeah, Ross. Just a little unfamiliar about the trading of currency between you know EOS and ETH, Ethereum, and that and the realized gain. Can you just maybe touch on a little bit more on how that's a realized gain if it's as like kind of like kind, not not making any money or losing money, it's just transfer the same currency. So the scenario is I have dollars, I buy Bitcoin, I use Bitcoin to buy Ethereum, everything wiggles, I use Ethereum to buy Bitcoin, and then I take Bitcoin out into cash. Yeah? yeah? I guess I'm, I'm not thinking out the cash, but just but still within the framework. Ethereum to EOS, he's asking if that's like each other. Oh, oh. Basically, 1031 is yeah. the question. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is that the specifics that you're kind of asking? Is it a 1031? Right, so I'm going to switch to Bitcoin, go to yeah. Binance, and I'll buy it from EOS, yeah. and then we'll more of the altcoin. And it's going to be the same amount for me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is that a realized gain? So that's why you're going to go buy it also? Yeah, so under the, under the, the framework, um, yes. Because of the way it's classified property to property, 
Um, but he's saying, I had uh, $10 of Bitcoin, and I bought $10 of Monero with it, and it's the same value, so there's no change. Therefore, it's not a taxable event because I have zero dollars changing in value. Well, what was your basis in what you traded? I mean, if you had bought that for $10, then there's no gain or loss. But if you had acquired that somehow for $1, then you, know, you, you trade something and you acquire something else. There's a different value. There's a spread of value between the two. The IRS just looks at that transaction as, well, okay, you, sold, you got rid of something, you got something in return. What did you get, and did you realize a gain on it? So if you can do it fast enough, then there's no calories. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So same thing. Like if if you go from dollar to GE stock to Tesla stock all in like a millionth of a second and nothing wiggled, mm -hmm. then you're fine. There was no capital gain or loss right. across it. Uh, but that's not what happens in blockchain. There's a 10, 20 minute wiggle or a day or or whatnot. Um, so so you would uh, even if you're doing high frequency trading, you're probably incurring small gains and losses that need to be tracked. Um, so just, you know, you probably need software to do that. And sometimes you have to go through Ethereum and stop USD, so it's hard to know what that number is. is yeah. So you need, you need, you need a, a buy the second uh, market data so that each time there's a transaction, Ethereum to EOS, that was just coin to coin, um, there's, a dollar, there's a US dollar value at that second that that transaction took place, mm -hmm. and you need to mark that transaction at that dollar value, which our software does. So. Let's, let's ask another um, question um, while she's coming up to our microphone. Um, if I have stock and I have a portfolio of stock and I have a robo-advisor, then it sits there and looks at the opportunity to sell these things slow and do tax loss harvesting. Is there value in tax loss harvesting of Bitcoin? Absolutely. Uh, okay. So there's, there's wash sales, so yeah. you can't do it uh, between June and July where you, you sell at a loss then buy right back. Uh, like June 1st, June 2nd, but uh, December 31st, you can sell off all your holdings if they're all down for the year, and then January 1st, you can buy back in a new tax holding period. Uh, with, if you're a corporation, they might be different, but for an individual investor, January 1st, December 31st, you absolutely can tax loss harvest. Yes, I have a question about your product. Is it retroactive? So say, I know you said Coinbase does an entire reporting on what you've spent and sold on Coinbase. But then a lot of people tend to go into Bitrex, Binance, GDAX, all of the different platforms. Can you, so say you haven't been tracking the same Can you moments, fix my pain, she says. I think it's relatively <laughs> likely for most people. Um, what do you do? Yeah. Um, so currently we support five exchanges, which is Coinbase, GDAX, uh, Binance, Kraken, and Poloniex. And we'll be adding Bitrex uh, this week, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we'll just keep adding more. We're, we're a very young company, uh, so we just haven't had enough time to add these uh, integrations through API or CSV upload. But we can also take uh, public address keys or CSVs. So all you would do is you would go to an exchange, download uh, your CSV, your, your entire transaction history, and uh, give it to us uh, or, or give it to your CPA, whatever you want to do. Um, we, we are absolutely going to provide like 2017, 2016, 2015 taxes service for you if you're just pulling everything from like uh, Coinbase API and a Bitrix API and that's all you're on and we have those. We can just stitch it all together for you, go back in history, mark it all to market, uh, get you to uh, a really nice like uh, ledger, aggregated ledger that will also break out all the different uh, you know uh, foreign transactions and all that, um, so that you know like your your one Bitcoin got split up into uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 Bitcoin in different transactions as it went through the block, and you know like we'll assemble that back together uh, and get you down to a single number that your CPA can use uh, in capital gain, capital loss, along with other assets, because we realized that uh, cryptocurrency generally isn't the entire asset portfolio of an investor. They have a home, they have a 401k, they have stocks. So you, you have to get to a single cryptocurrency number that was a gain or a loss, but there's also play there, right? Like if you had a bunch of cryptocurrency gains and you short sold the house four years ago and you're carrying losses, you're like, oh, I'm gonna take all these gains on my cryptocurrency, I'm gonna apply it to that like capital loss I've been holding in my short. <laughs> you don't think you could do that? I don't, I, my, my lesson is no. Yeah. It's, it's something that I don't, I think that's more in the gray area rather than black and white. So that's, well, asset, yeah. asset class to asset class. So if I do that in angel investing and I make a oh, great yeah. big win in angel investing and then I lose on my rental, mm -hmm. tough luck. Yeah. I, I carry that loss and I carry that, yeah, yeah, that gain losses, and, yeah. right? But, yeah. Yeah. One last question. You're, you're mining Bitcoin and you have uh, someone you're working with and they 
chance for you Bitcoin. How would you treat that um, with the IRS? So the mining brings up the question of, you know, are you conducting a business or, or a hobby? Um, you know, if you're running a, a mining operation and it's actually a business, then we start to get in a whole different sphere of tax treatment. We're, we're starting to get out of the capital gain loss areas and into just normal business income and deduction. Uh, so if you're deemed to be running a business and you are actually running a business and someone transfers you a coin, so in that example, is someone paying you for your services or are you using coin to... No, he's mining it. Oh, okay. So when you, re when you acquire a coin from mining... Yeah, if you're running a business and that's just normal gross receipts and you have normal business deductions to apply against those gross receipts. The as, problem as is... As opposed to short-term or long-term capital gain. Correct. So yeah. we have three different tax choices. Income, short-term gain, long-term gain. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then under the income regime, I mean, you're subject to all the potential self-employment issues around running a business. Um, if it's incorporated, you know, potentially double tax, things like that. Uh, and then, you know, just to touch on the hobby gains and losses, if you're just mining for fun and you're not really deemed to be running a business, then your hobby losses are only deductible up to your hobby gains. It's not like you can be running a mining operation at a loss, using that to offset I income from other sources when it's really just a hobby. Yeah. Cool. So thank our panel for being here. Um, I encourage you to meet the other people in the room because they're all interested in blockchain in a way that you are. So there's interesting people here. And again, three weeks from now, we'll do the next one here. So the next three weeks, we won't be here. In May, first weekend in May, there's a blockchain startup weekend. If you want to do hacking and starting a business around blockchain, you might want to consider that. You can find that on startupweekend.org. Thanks for coming.